2002, my mom got her first mobile phone. I remember that vividly, the SMSs that she was sending to me, because they were a bit weird. They were very formal. My mom was not ta never talked to me like that, the way that she was sending me those text messages. In fact, all those uh, text messages or using the text messages per se uh, as a new mean of communication, new technology, if you will, was new to her. And she was still learning how to use those. Fast forward, 2012, the start of boom of social media, specifically Facebook. Everybody's attention was going through the social media. And of course, wherever our attention goes, all the businesses and politicians, they're going to follow. They're going to come over there because they want to sell to you something. But something was not working there over there either. It looked like they don't know how to communicate with us over there. It reminded me the time that my mom was dealing with, this, uh, with the mobile phone to send those text messages. It looked like they don't know how to use this new technology. In fact, there was a big difference as well between what they were doing and how my mom was using it, because they had a very specific objective. They wanted to convince you to do something that they wanted you to do. That thing, of course, for businesses, it was trying to convince you to give them their money, selling you their products or services, and for the politicians, was to convince you to give them your votes. It was interesting to me to watch that almost all of them were making one simple mistake, which was fundamental. All of them, whenever they wanted to communicate with you, they were talking about what they sell. Instead of starting the conversation with you on why you should buy what they sell. There is a huge difference here, and depends on how you start this conversation, your whole communication strategy changes. And this was the point that I realized that they're trying to communicate with a complicated system, which is the human. So in order for us to understand how to communicate with this system, first we need to understand how the system works how the system acts or reacts to certain things. In order to do that, I started a very interesting journey. I started reading about psychology, many different psychology books. I started following the um, biology, behavioral biology courses of um, Professor Robert Sapolsky of Stanford University. I started reading about uh, human history, specifically you all know Harari. I start going through the ancient uh, literature and uh, philosophy, specifically here also uh, Seneca, the Roman uh, philosopher. And I was connecting the dots as I was moving uh, along this journey. And at some point, all these together, which were evolving, came to a frame which I called it humanizing the digital world. This humanizing the digital world, which in essence, was everything we've learned from psychology, behavioral biology, history and philosophy, technically our offline world, how we can take all these and apply them in our online world, in the digital world, to be more human there. This whole journey went from university lectures in the United States, in Italy, Switzerland, sharing that as keynote speeches in various conferences across Europe. I spent a lot of time and did a lot of workshops with uh, sales, marketing, and HR teams of various corporations also across Europe. And I was very sure that this is it. it this is the only thing that we uh, didn't get right. And if we get this one right, then we're good. And then the pandemic happened. The pandemic happened, and everyone was confused. I was observing. The first thing that all governments started to do, they started to mandate us to do certain things 
to prevent us to catch the virus. Wear a mask. Put on gloves. Wash your hands. Use hand sanitizer. Or, more importantly, stay inside. Don't go out. Lockdown. I was looking at the data. Obviously, all these uh, activities that they have done and the mandates start showing some results. But something was not feeling right. Something was missing over there. I started looking at the data, and I noticed that those who were at the certain level of well-being, physically, mentally, and spiritually, at the end, these people, they had a very low chance of dying from this virus, regardless of the age, or even being hospitalized. And if I could see these data, it means that everybody else were able to see these data, especially the governments. So it was interesting for me why there are not many programs in a local level or national level or international level, now that we were all inside our homes, to help us have a better diet, what we put in our body. Or now that we're not moving much, to help us do more exercises, practice some yoga. Or now that we are isolated, we're far from our families and friends, maybe not in distance, but in fact, we were not able to see them, do some meditation. I noticed very, very few programs that have actually been there. Small town, Huntington in Long Island, New York, they started having a, a town diet to uh, combat COVID-10. In fact, that's not a mistake. That 10 refers to the 10 pounds, four and a half more or less kilos, that people have started to gain during the lockdown. So they started to create that program and offer this uh, diet to the whole town to prevent them to gain that weight. That was in May. And in September, the government of Singapore partnered with Apple and started giving prizes, monetary prizes, paying people to use Apple watches and do more exercises. But at the end, all of these, it was not enough. I started having a reflection. I was thinking, wait a minute, I've been advocating the humanization of the digital world, meaning being more human in the digital uh, domain. But at some point, I noticed that we're actually, as a collective, we're losing sight on how to be human in the real life. So I asked myself a question, because till now, everything that I was doing is to take what I've learned in the on, uh, offline world and apply it in the online world. But maybe now that we were spending a lot of time online, was the moment to ask this question, is there anything that we learned from the digital world, online world, that we can apply to the offline world to be more human there? the reflection of all these 10 or so uh, years that I've been working in the digital domain came to two main points. Point one, obviously by now all of us know the importance of the data, and we heard sentences like, data is the new currency. And of course, I've been also telling these for years that yes, data is the new currency, but having a lot of unnecessary data doesn't make you any richer. Also, because we have a lot of data, we started measuring things, not because they were important or they would add value to our businesses or lives, but because they were easy to measure. Just think about the reports that you've seen in your various uh, companies that maybe you were working. The reports in the last few years started to become very beautiful reports. They have different charts. They have new KPIs to follow, which at the end, they don't say anything. They just make us look smarter, look more sophisticated. So my question of, is there anything that we have learned in the digital world that we can apply in the offline world to be more human there, evolved to a different question. And the question was, 
are we measuring the right things in our lives? Or are we measuring things just because they're easy to measure? If I ask all of you in the audience, how much do you weigh? You don't need to answer. But when I mention that, almost all of you have a quasi-accurate number in your head about your weight. And somehow you translate that number into how healthy you are, if you're healthy or not. But if I ask you, how are you, really? How's your state of well-being? How many of you can accurately answer that? How many of you can measure that? In the last 10 years or so, I've been seeing in the news that Finland is the happiest country in the world. Denmark is the happiest country in the world this year. Norway this year is the happiest country in the world. And it was, to me, always a fun fact to just see. But for the first time, I was like, you know what? Let me look into this. I looked at the latest version and the uh, last published report of World Happiness Report in 2020. And in the introduction of chapter two, they mentioned the central purpose of the report as the, to review the science of measuring and understanding subjective well-being. I was like, uh-huh, that's a point. That's where I need to dig into. So I started reading all the World Happiness Reports from 2012, which was the first one, till 2020. Year by year, chapter by chapter, line by line. I didn't know what I'm looking for, but I knew there should be something there that is going to help me to answer my question. In chapter 5 of 2019 report, I saw this graph. This graph shows the general happiness level of American teenagers. It was interesting to see that from 1991 till 2011, it was growing steadily. And at some point around 2012, it started to decline steadily again. In the same chapter, it was mentioning that there were numerous indicator of, uh, indicators of low psychological well-being between these teenagers. There were signs of depression, self-harm, or uh, suicide ideations. And it was mostly between uh, girls and young women. In the same report, it was showing that it was not just in the United States at that time, but also in the UK. A bit further, it was interesting to see that in 2019, the violent crime rate was low, unemployment was super low, and the income per capita was increasing steadily for decades. So technically, what we know as standards of living was improving. So should your happiness, but it has not. Something was not making sense over there. So after all of these, it was like a circle. I got back to my question again. Are we measuring the right things in our life? And I'm not here to give you any answer, because the answer to this question is very subjective for a person to another, or the same person in different phases of your lives. The answer to this question might be different. I'm here to urge you to please ask the right questions and try to measure what really matters. Thank you. <laughs>